Hi everybody. Let's work through some examples of naming these simple ionic compounds together. And I'm going to take you through both writing the name as, re as well as writing the formula if we're given the name. Um, and let's start this quick lesson by talking about uh, what is a simple ionic compound? Because in in this course, we're going to learn how to name ionic compounds, um, and that actually includes a few different combinations of ions that can come together. So, a simple ionic compound here, we're talking about a metal plus a nonmetal. So, two elements here. Um, but when when we're looking at the metals, we are looking at metals that have only one possible charge. Um, meaning that uh, this is the most simplified uh, ionic compound that we can we can deal with. So the metals are going to be these first two families of metals, okay, as well as a few other metals. Um, but you'll notice that many of the metals in the center of the periodic table, if you look at the periodic table that we, we give you in the course, which is also from your Science 10 data booklet, You'll notice that some of these metals actually have more than one possible ion charge. So cobalt, for example, has a 2 plus charge or a 3 plus charge in the periodic table. What that means is that cobalt can either donate two electrons or can donate three electrons, uh, thereby give, making two possible ions. So these types of metals, these multivalent metals that we see in the center of the table, absolutely can form ionic compounds as well. But we're not going to look at any examples of those right yet. So we're going to stick to the most simple ionic compounds, which is metals. Okay, so any of these metals over here in the first two families, um, as well as some of the metals over here in our periodic table that we see uh, just form one possible ion charge. Okay, uh, and then in the next lesson, we are going to learn how to deal with these metals in the center where there's more than one possible ion that can be formed when these elements lose their electrons. And there's an extra step involved in the naming there, and so we won't deal with that yet because we're just wanting to start off um, with the simplest example. So metal plus nonmetals are simple ionic compounds. Uh, and the nonmetals, of course, we're referring to the nonmetals on the right-hand side of our staircase. Okay, uh, and they're indicated on your periodic table. So let's go ahead and start with the naming uh, of ionic compounds. So in the lesson, we learned that when we name an ionic compound, we always write the metal's name first, and we write it exactly how we see it on the periodic table. So we go to our periodic table, we find the metal, and clean this up a bit, we find our metal, so if, for example, calcium, and we simply write calcium. Okay, pretty simple. So our, our metal is named first, followed by the non-metal. Oh, non-metal. So the non-metal is, is named second, and when we write the name of the non-metal, we write it as we see it on the periodic table, but we change the ending of its name to an IDE. And by doing that, we now indicate that we're talking about a compound. This is the name of the compound. Okay? So let's go ahead and do some examples of that. So first one we've got here is CAI2. Okay? And to name this simple ionic compound, the first thing you want to do all the time is get used to using your periodic table. So you get out your periodic table and you look them up. And you First, determine, is this an ionic compound? For it to be an ionic compound, we need to be dealing with a metal and a non-metal. So we look for calcium and we look for iodine on a periodic table. And here we find calcium on the left-hand side. It is indeed a metal. Okay, and there's its name, calcium. I look for the I on the, on the right-hand side, and I see it over here with the non-metals. There it is. Its name is iodine. And so I know, yes, this is an ionic compound. I can go ahead and name it accordingly. So I'm going to use the name of the metal first, calcium, and the name of the non-metal second, iodine. So I have calcium. And for this first one, I'm going to write out iodine, even though we know that's not correct yet. Okay, and then I'm going to change the ending of my non-metal from I-N-E to I-D-E. So, calcium iodide is the name of my compound. 
just to carry on here, sometimes you wonder about these subscripts. Do I need to do anything with this too? What do I do with that? Does it make a difference? Well, uh, in terms of naming this, it doesn't make a difference to us. It's this formula is simply telling us the number of specific atoms that are involved in the compound. So here I can see I have two iodine atoms bonded to one calcium uh, atom. And if you go back to your periodic table and you look up the ion charges on both of these elements, you'll see that a calcium ion has a 2 plus charge and an iodide, iodide ion has a negative 1 charge. So if you want to just think about what this looks like for a minute, you have calcium with a 2 plus charge here, okay, and you have 2 iodide ions each with a negative one char ion charge that are attracted to this calcium 2 plus cation. And so that formula there, those subscripts are simply showing us this is the number and type of elements um, that are involved in this bond. So as far as naming goes here, it doesn't, the two does not need to be included anywhere in our name. All right, let's do another example. So I've got, the next one is RB3N. Again, my first step, look up your elements figure out if you have an ionic compound. So RB and N, when I look them up, I find RB on the left hand side right here, its name is rubidium, and N is found on the right hand side with the nonmetals, its name is nitrogen, so I do indeed have an ionic compound, and I'm going to write the names accordingly now. Metal first, rubidium, nonmetal second, nitrogen. Okay, so here we go, rubidium, And nitrogen is the name of the nonmetal, so it gets written second. But I need to be careful, I'm not done yet. I'm going to remove the ending on the nonmetal and I'm going to replace it with an IDE. And in the case of nitrogen here, I'm actually going to go right back and take the whole OGEN right off and it becomes rubidium nitride. Okay, rubidium nitride. Perfect. Here's our next one, S, R, and O. Again, first step, check that you have an ionic compound. Look up S, R, look up O. So I do that, and cleaning up my periodic table a little bit so we're not getting confused. When I look for S, R, I do indeed see it on the left-hand side. It's a metal. Its name is strontium. O is found on the right-hand side. It is a non-metal. Its name is oxygen and so it's ionic, I can go ahead and name it strontium okay again oxygen is another one that gets changed here and in all of these cases you basically when you're replacing the ending with IDE you're going all the way back uh, and you're going to start crossing out at, at, at the vowel. So you're going to go right back to where you see a, a consonant here. So in this case, the R. Here it's going to be the G. Or, pardon me. It's going to be the X here, actually. This is a bit of an anomaly. We're going to go right back to the X. So it's actually going to be, it's not going to be oxygide, which people commonly think it might be. It's actually oxide. And you probably know that because you can think of carbon dioxide or other common compounds that you're familiar with. And the oxide, um, uh, is written after the ID is written after the X here, so this is a bit of a bit of a, a strange example, but we need to remember it. Strontium oxide is the name of this compound. Let's do one more together. We're getting in the hang of it now. Hopefully, again, we've got Ba3P2. The first step is to look up uh, both of the elements on the periodic table. Looking at Ba and looking at P, I find Ba on the left hand side. It's right under strontium here. Its name is barium, and P is found on the right-hand side. It's a nonmetal, and its name is phosphorus. And we're going to have to change the ending on that nonmetal. So our name is barium. The metal is written just as it's shown on the periodic table, and the ending. I wonder if you can guess it. <laughs> phosphorus is going to be changed. We take off the O-R-U-S and it becomes phosphide. The nonmetals um,
take some getting used to in terms of changing their names accordingly. The more you practice and the more questions you do, uh, the better you become at it. You'll notice there's not that many non-metals. So there's not that many elements here that you're, you're going to, that are going to be involved in ionic bonds. Um, and actually, when, later when you learn how to name covalent bonds, you also change the ending. Uh, and so we continuously keep running across the very same non-metals, and we get pretty, pretty good at it after a while. So practice is, is your best, best method here for figuring those out. And you will get, they will become second nature after a while. Let's go backwards now, and instead of naming, we're going to write the formula given the name. This is actually uh, really simple, um, and here uh, we are, we're given the name calcium selenide. We're going to go back to periodic table, and this time we have to find out what is the charge on each of these elements. So I need to know what is their symbol, what is their charge, so that I can write the formula correctly. Okay, it's a mistake to go ahead and just write the symbols exactly as you see them without thinking about how they combine. Okay, so let's do the first one as an example together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look up calcium and I'm going to look at selenide and I'm going to write their ion charges right above them. So calcium, just clean up my periodic table, calcium is found as a metal on the left hand side. Here it is, okay, calcium has a 2 plus charge and selenide, we have to remember when we're looking up our non-metal that the ending of the name has been changed. So I'm looking for, I have to think about, hmm, selenide, what is that? Well, it's selenium, or selenium, sorry. So I'm going to find that on my right-hand side, okay, and I see that its ion charge is 2 negative. So I'm going to come back here and write that out. So I have calcium, 2 plus, and Selenium has the element symbol capital S, lowercase e. Remember that the first letter is always capitalized, and if there's a second letter, it's never capitalized. And there I'm going to write my, my ion charge. And before I write the formula, I have to swap and drop or crisscross, bring these charges down. So I'm going to bring down the 2. Okay, so it's gone. And I'm going to bring down this 2. And this tells me how these two ions combine. So what it's telling me here is that for every two calcium ions, I have to have two sel selenium ions uh, in order for them to combine in equal ratios. But we know that if we have two of each, it's also true to say that we could have one of each. Okay, so whenever you have any subscripts that can be reduced, you go ahead and reduce them. In other words, I can divide both of these by two. And so what I will write then as my final answer is going to be calcium, selenide, like this. And I could, in my mind, I'm remembering that I have a little one there, but we don't actually write the ones. Okay, they're not necessary. If you see calcium, you know there's one of them there. Okay, so we don't actually go write the, the subscript one into our, into our formula. And there is my answer. That's the swap and drop or crisscross method. Another method of thinking of this, if we, if we go back to just looking them up off a periodic table for a moment, remember that we looked up calcium and it had a 2 plus charge, and selenide had a ne 2 negative charge. So if you think of this in, in using the mental math um, or combining method, really all you're doing is saying, how many of each ion do I need to combine in a way that the ion charges will balance each other out. So I'm trying to get to a neutral uh, compound, which means that however many negative charges I have has to be equal to the number of positive charges on the cation. So in this case, because they have the same charge, I only require one of each of them. And so you could immediately then go to your formula, calcium, only one, selenium, only one, and therefore that's my formula. Okay, so that's how the mental math method works, and it's your choice on how you want to approach that. Most students like the swap and drop method because it's fast, but both are absolutely correct and effective. Let's do another example, lithium oxide. So again, looking up lithium, looking up oxide, be careful with this, the name's been changed, we have to recognize that this is oxygen, 
when I look it up on my periodic table. So I'm going to look up lithium and I'm going to look up oxide and I'm going to find out what are their ion charges. So here's lithium on the left hand side. It has a plus charge which means plus one. Okay, And oxygen is here on the right hand side and it has a two minus charge and its symbol is O. So I have lithium and I'm going to put plus one just for the sake of clarity and oxygen has a two minus charge. So the swap and drop method tells me to bring down the one and bring down the two and my answer then becomes lithium two oxygen or oxide just one I don't need to write that with subscript one in I can't reduce this any further so I'm done using the mental math method for a moment for those of you that that are more comfortable with that okay here are the two ions that I have and it's just like a scale I've got two negative on this side so in order to balance out the two negative I need to have another lithium here because two negatives need to be balanced with two positives and so my formula subscripts are, are used to show how many of each you have so the two indicates that there are two lithiums and I have only one oxygen so I don't need to write any subscript there okay so both of those are um, excellent ways to figure out your formula all right our very last example that I have here is strontium phosphide and again looking up the element symbols looking up their ion charges let's do that strontium strontium is right here SR2 plus phosphide I have to be a little bit careful with that it's not phosphide that I'm looking up on my periodic table because that's the name of the ion the element would be phosphorus and there it is it's a P symbol is a P with three negative as its charge and so I have strontium 2 plus P3 minus strontium is SR 2 plus P 3 minus using that swap and drop method I'm going to bring down the charges so I bring down the 2 and I bring down the 3 and remember once you brought them down okay in the formula we don't have any charges written only subscripts so I want to cross those out and so I can't reduce this anymore so it's going to be SR3 P2 there's my formula using the mental math method for a moment again go ahead and do that okay so on one side you have a strontium 2 plus ion and on the other side you have 3 minus well how are you going to have uh, equal balance because currently you don't uh, have equal charges or equal um, numbers on each side so you think well what's the the lowest common denom or the lowest um, multiplier here that I could find the lowest common multiplier uh, well if I had two of these that would give me a four plus charge but I noticed that uh, four cannot be divided by three or three I, I, no multiple of three is going to give me four so we've got to keep going okay let's add another one of these and see well three and three would be six so that would give me a six minus charge could I get to six on the other side with my positive ions well yes I could if I added one more strontium then I would have a six plus charge and then I would be balanced so the formula will be three strontium ions with two phosphide ions and again that gives me this formula right here SR3P2